and it will cover up through uh, homework. It'll cover up through the homework material that was due the previous next Tuesday, actually, no. which actually works out well because beyond beyond your next homework assignment, much of what you're going to do in your homework is going to be uh, using Mathematica or some kind of, of of symbolic computing package. So, giving you those kinds of problems in an exam won't work. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, any further ado? I'm having, the, the, the material in the course is getting a little wonky because I've, I'm trying to smash a few topics together so that we can get through the really cool stuff at the end because we're losing dates, but what's happening is the lectures that I usually have for Tuesdays are shorter than the lectures for Thursdays because we have a quiz, which today we've wasted 10 minutes anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But, uh, so I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm just gonna talk about some stuff and then you'll go home and you'll be done. Awesome, that is a great start. First marker, I draw, is completely dead in the water. Did you record that whole conversation about the midterm? No. No. When did you press the camera button? Huh? When did you press record? I just walked over here and pressed it again. It's on. Yeah, it's recording. Yeah, thank you. No, uh, actually, the last time I taught this course, yeah, it was the last time I taught this course uh, on my birthday. My, my senior design student, Peter, was in the back of the room, and I'm like, hey, Peter, would you hit record on the thing? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we started lecturing, and then the whole class sang happy birthday, and it was really sweet. And then it got to the end of the lecture, and I went to the camera, and he had never actually turned the camera off. The best birthday present of all. I know, I know. So I actually had to go and record myself giving that lecture in an empty room. <laughs> Did you actually pull cards and everything? And I made jokes, and I laughed at them. <laughs> It's there. It's there. You can, I mean, it's on YouTube. You can go look it up. It's pretty horrible. We can also watch people singing to you. What lecture is it? Oh, you can see a lot of good stuff. You can see the fire prof and the... All right, anyway, shut up. My turn. <laughs> okay, so we... Okay, this is it. I mean, you know, if I actually get through what I want to get through today, the final topic we're going to talk about is general relativity. But I don't think I'm going to get there because we've talked too much. We would like, and this is going to be an integral part of general relativity, a coordinate invariant way to uh, say if a space is flat or curved. And it turns out that some of the naive ways that you think you might be able to do this turn, uh, end up not really working out for you. So here's a couple of uh, failed uh, guesses. Um, you could consider the metric. Okay, you could look at the metric and try and say, oh, that metric looks really simple or that metric looks really complicated. Um, that's not actually uh, a very good measure of curvature for reasons which you've already alluded to. But just to give you an example, um, obviously if I give you a space and I say that globally the metric looks like this, globally means it looks like that everywhere, then we can all agree that the space is flat. I mean, this is the metric of Minkowski space in Cartesian coordinates, okay? Um, but the problem is, that I could take that same space and I could do a coordinate transformation in which case the metric is going to take a new form that is going to be given by some linear transformation or two linear transformations on the indices of the old metric. And depending on the coordinate choice uh, I pick, you know, the, ending, the, the metric that I end up with could be very complicated. However, that very complicated metric is still describing flat space. So you can't look at a complicated metric and necessarily say it's complicated, therefore the space is curved. All right? We can, if we can get a global constant metric, say the, the space is flat. But we also have to be careful because one of the things we know is that in a small region, we can always choose local inertial coordinates that makes the metric look like this in a tiny neighborhood. But then you have to ask, does it look like that everywhere or not? Okay. So generally speaking, just looking at the metric is not going to be a very, very good way 
of figuring out whether or not a space is curved. We need something gooder. Okay? Um, here is a better option. In flat space, or flat space time, we have Cartesian coordinates. The Christoffel symbols are equal to y. what? Uh, it's the simplest case. Zero. zero, exactly. These are zero. So one thing you might be able to say is if the Christoffel symbols are zero, then the space is flat. And if the Christoffel symbols are not zero, then the space is not flat. Okay. Well, we already know that that's not good either. <laughs> come, 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 come. That's, that's, that's a good one. Tell me about this Christoffel symbol. All right, okay. Um, we already know that this is not going to work either. Because we can take flat space and describe it with spherical polar coordinates, and you know from your homework that in that set of coordinates, the Christoffel symbols are not zero. There's actually a, a more salient way to figure out that the Christoffel symbols won't work for us, which is something I'm going to allude to later. And the problem with it is the fact that this is not a tensor. So consider the transformation of the Christoffel symbols. So gamma, mu prime, mu prime, lambda prime. Now, if the Christoffel symbols were tensors, and then this, this, this. If the Christoffel symbols were tensors, then they would transform like this. And then we would have the nice result that if the Christoffel symbols were zero in one coordinate system, they would be zero in all coordinate systems. Because if this thing is zero, it doesn't matter what you act on it with, you're going to get zero back. Okay? However, the Christoffel symbols are not tensors. They do not transform like this. They transform with this extra piece. And this is, the, this is where we see the importance of the form of this extra term. You'll notice the second term here doesn't contain gamma at all. So you can start in a set of coordinates where the gamma is zero, but then choosing the coordinate transformation can generate something non-zero by this term. Okay. So what I want you to see, first of all from this, is the Christoffel symbols are not a good measure of curvature. But secondly, I hope you can see why whatever measure of curvature we get, it would be convenient if it were a tensor. Because if it were, if it were a tensor, then if it's zero in one set of coordinates, it's zero in all coordinates. Okay? All right. Um, so what are we to do? What in the world are we going to do? Well, there is an idea which I have alluded to earlier that we are going to make more precise. And that is the notion that one way to sense curvature on a space is to consider moving a vector around a closed path. Okay. So for example, if we consider a closed path from the North Pole down to the equator, along the equator, and then back up to the North Pole, then a vector in said space, say pointing tangent to this path, if we parallel transport it along this path, we get down here and it points like that. We parallel transport it along this path, we get to that point, it points like that, and then when we come back up to the North Pole, it is rotated with respect to its original orientation. So maybe, just maybe, 
we can use this sort of how vectors change under transport around a closed path as a measure of curvature. And that's going to turn out to be exactly what we should use. Okay. Now, to formalize this and actually get an equation out of it, I'm going to think of a slightly simpler path than this. This is kind of a weird path. It's got three sides, and they kind of, they, they, you know, these aren't parallel to each other. So to, to make the math a little bit easier, we're going to choose a simple closed path. Um, so if I have A, then what I can do is I consider shifting away from A by some coordinate differential delta x mu. And then I'm going to turn and I'm going to shift by some other coordinate differential delta x nu. And then I'm going to go back up to here with a coordinate differential minus delta x mu and then get back to where I started by minus delta x mu. Okay? It's a closed path. It has the advantage that the opposite sides are simply inverses of each other, additive inverses of each other. Okay? And then we can ask the following question. If I start with a vector at A, say V, V A, and it's going to have a vector index lambda, so A is just saying it's the vector at this location. Then what I can imagine is I have some operator which is going to first shift it by delta x mu, and I'll just say like that's the operator symbol. I'll talk about what this operator is in a minute. Then I shift it by delta x mu. Then I shift it by minus delta x mu. And then lastly, minus delta x mu. So remember we act we act on the vector with the thing directly next to it first, and then second, and then third, and then fourth. So you're doing the operations in this order on the vector v. And then that is going to give us some transformed version of the vector, again, at the location a. And then all we have to do at that point is compute the difference between these two things. If this is non-zero, or if this is zero, then we know the space is flat. And that is, and this is the important part, um, if we do this little closed path, that closed path is going to depend on where your starting point A is. Because, you know, if I start there, that's the closed path. If I start over here, that's the closed path, okay? So when you do this, starting at some point A, this answer, and I should write this, what this really means is code for this. That is, you're starting at some location in the space, and you're computing the change around a path sort of identified with that point. Well, that's just really code for this. These are all functions of where you are in the space. So the answer to is the space flat is the answer to what is the change in the vector if I do this for all of the different little squares that I could cover the space with. I mean, if I pick just, you know, I can imagine some weird space. I can't even draw it, but I'll try it. You know, where it's like a sphere, but then the sphere like has this like this appendage, <laughs> psychic cancer. And on this appendage, it happens to be flat. Okay? So you you do your little, you know, carry a vector around a, a little square and you get that it comes back to itself and you're like, the space is flat. Well the space is not flat, the space is it's, it's not flat. <laughs> this is the dumbbell space. Um, because if you did it over here, you know, you'd get all these weird effects. So the, the point is, is that when you do these paths, you do a path for every point in the space. They all have to give you zero change in order to be able to say the space is flat. Okay? But that's fine. I mean, we're going to get a function, and if the function vanishes, then it's zero everywhere. Okay. <clears throat> now, 
There is a slightly different way to, um, to phrase this construction, which is going to be a little bit more useful for our purposes. And that is, instead of actually carrying the vector from A around a closed path back to A, I'm going to consider a slight variant. And that is, I'm going to consider two points on sort of diagonally opposite sides of the path called A and B. Okay? And now, a completely equivalent way of measuring the same thing is to take a vector at A and transport it to B using the shift along delta x mu and then the shift along delta x nu. Okay? And that's going to give me some version of the vector at point B. Okay. But alternatively, what I can do is I can take the vector and I can get to B by going this way. Okay. So I can apply, and now this is going to be going this way is applying minus minus delta x nu, but that's just delta x nu. And then going down is applying minus minus delta x mu, which is just delta x mu. And then this is going to give me some different or ostensibly different vector. And then what I can do is just take the difference between these. Okay. And maybe this is at point B. All right. And I would argue to you that the difference here measures the same thing as the difference there. Okay? Because if you go around the closed path and the effect is zero, then if you go halfway and get an effect, you have to get the opposite effect going this way. Okay? All right. You ready? Everybody put your glasses on. Got them on. Good. What is the difference between these two expressions? The commutator of x mu and x mu. Yeah, it, the, the only difference is the order of mu and nu. But we're going to reverse the order and subtract. What is that? That's a commutator. Okay? These are those things that you use all the time in quantum mechanics. So it turns out that by considering a commutator, we can measure curvature. Now, just I'm going to draw it in this picture, although I don't really like the il illustration I'm about to give you, but I'm just going to draw it anyway. Um, I, I just This is not the best example because it's not a four-sided path. I can kind of make it a four-sided path by kind of thinking about this, but then it's still a little wonky. But I'm going to show it to you anyway just to show you that the commutator tells you. So if I take this vector and I first go this way, I end up at B pointing like that. Right? But if I take this vector and I first go this way, uh, where it, how much, how much it, it changes depends on the relative angle between these. But let's say these are 90 degrees. This is a 90 degree angle. Okay? Then upon parallel transport, I'll end up like that. And then when I pull this thing over to B, the results from going this way to B versus going this way to B uh, are different. So the difference between the resulting vectors would measure the, okay? So you can do it either way. Now, in all of this, the burning question should be, what the hell is this? That is, I need some kind of operator that I can use to act on a vector, and its action on that vector should be to transport the vector along the shift delta x mu, keeping the vector parallel to itself. So we want to parallel transport the vector along the path. Or we want to talk about how the vector changes from one end of the delta x mu interval to the other, where the only way to make sense of comparing them is to take the parallel transport of this one back to this one. Have we encountered any object that would do that for us? What? Uh, the parallel transport thing? Well, the parallel transport equation is actually a little more machinery than we need. 
So where did this quantity, V lambda at x mu plus delta x mu minus V lambda x mu parallel over delta x mu, where did that quantity come in? The directional covariant? It's actually just the covariant oh, derivative. The covariant, yep. It's the covariant derivative. The covariant derivative and we, last time we talked about the, the difference between the covariant and the directional covariant. The covariant derivative is literally just taking the vector at one position, shifting the coordinate position by delta x mu, and then comparing the parallel transported version of the vector. Okay? So the operator that we can use to, to measure this is just the covariant derivative. Right? So at the end of the day, I would argue to you that a good measure of curvature can be calculated simply by considering the commutator of the covariant derivative. But we do have to let this act on something in order to make sense of it. This is just like what you usually see in quantum mechanics. You've got to let the commutator act on something because there's derivatives in it. You, don't, you lose track of what to do with the derivatives if you don't let them take the derivative of something. Okay? Again, this thing, when we calculate it, is generally going to be a function of position. And so what you can say is, if this thing equals zero everywhere, then the space is flat. And that's coordinate invariant for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Okay? So here we go. Again, all this thing is doing is it's taking a vector and it's moving it along a closed path like that and then a closed path like that and it's subtracting the difference. That's all it's doing for us. Okay, so we can do this. There is no mystery here. Del mu, del nu, v lambda minus del nu, del nu, v lambda. Okay? Now, clearly, to save work, we're going to work out this one. And then whatever expression we get, we just write it down again, swapping mu and nu everywhere. Because that's the only difference here. So I'll just write this one down, and then we can just kind of infer what would happen if we wrote down the second one. Now, be careful. This is a derivative acting on the derivative of a vector. So that means that we really need to be kind of thinking about it in steps. So before we uh, get started, what kind of object is that thing right there? Like what kind of tensor object is that given? Yeah, it's a 1-1 it's a one -one in the old language of, of dual and, and vector indices. But it's a tensor that we can kind of think of as having a lower nu and an upper lambda. Now remember, we, I gave you the definition of how the covariant derivative acts on any tensor. It doesn't matter if it's got you know, do upper indices, lower indices, mixed indices. So I'm just saying that because to figure out what to do with this thing on this, you really need to look at the indices there. Okay. So without any further ado, uh, this guy, we're going to break up into the covariant derivative of the factor itself. Okay. So this is just the covariant derivative of the vector itself. And then we're going to del mu that. And then, um, okay, so here we go. So this covariant derivative <coughs> starts with a partial. Um, actually, let me, let me do it this way first. I won't break this up yet. We're going to go ahead and leave it as del mu v lambda for the moment. Okay, so right now I'm actually expanding that partial derivative, and then I'll come back and expand that one. So this partial derivative is acting on this kind of tensor, so we start with the, this covariant derivative is acting on this tensor, so we start with the partial, that's how the covariant derivative always starts, and then we get a minus contribution from the Christoffel symbols because there's a lower index, and then just getting my indices to work out.
Okay. Notice the Christoffel symbol is transforming the lower index here. That's where the new comes from. And then we have to add another Christoffel term because of the upper index. That one, of course, comes with a plus sign. And can I do it? No, I can't. Uh, let me give it a different name. Call it alpha. I shouldn't do that. I should call it. Well, I'll call it alpha. Screw it. You guys are mature enough to be able to know you shouldn't simultaneously do summations over indices that appear in four different places. Um, okay. So, and then we would subtract from that what we would get if we interchanged mu and nu. Okay. So all I've done so far is I've taken this covariant derivative and acted on the two indices of this thing. Should that okay. be alpha be a B alpha? Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, B alpha. Thank you. Totally should be a B alpha. Okay, so now I'm going to go in and I'm going to take this guy. And I'm going to cram it in here, and cram it in here, and cram it in here. Okay? So this is going to blow up a little bit. Um, And look, this is not the most inspiring thing that we could possibly do. Like, you know, you'd probably rather me tell you some jokes or something. If I had a good joke, I would tell it to you. If I had a good joke and I could write down on the board at the same time, I would be awesome. But I'm not. Um, according to some people, I am not. Uh, just kidding. Uh, all right, so I've almost gotten through it, so I'm going to stop talking because um, that's lame. Okay. Holy crap, that's big. <coughs> okay. So um, I was just copying and pasting, uh, but is it clear what I did here? Yes, no, maybe? Maybe. <coughs> Okay, so if we plug it, if we plug the expression for this covariant derivative in here, then the key thing is, is that we've got a derivative which is acting on this thing. So the derivative acting on this is just going to give me this term, but then when the derivative acts on this, I've got to do a product rule. So this is the first term of the product rule from the derivative acting on this. This is the second term of the product rule from the derivative acting on this. And then the last four terms are just plugging things in here. Okay. So even if you can't like, make sense of all the index gymnastics in the moment, just realize the first three terms come from this one, and then the last six terms, two come from here, two come from here. Okay. Now, I get, oh, the red marker. I never get why, so we'll do purple. Purple's good. There's a purple marker. Oh, the purple markers. Awesome. That's the best marker ever in the history of markers. Okay, so now I'm going to come in and I'm going to play favorites. I'm going to pick on people. There's that, there's that, and there's that, okay? And gauge, gauge. What is the significance of the three underlying terms? Exactly. Therefore, so when you subtract off, they should vanish in the commentary. Exactly. Okay. This, the partial derivatives, you can always switch the order. So when you subtract this term with the new and the mu switched, well, you just switch the new and the mu back and you get zero. And then similarly here, and similarly, well, actually, these are a little bit more complicated. 
If I switch the mu and the nu here, it turns it into this term. But then I'm going to subtract what I got when I switch the indices. So this term will cancel with the index swapped version of this one, and this one will cancel with the index swapped version of that one. If that doesn't make sense, literally just write an example down and you'll see it happen. Okay? But, but clearly, I hope you all can sink your teeth onto at least this one. That is zero because I can switch these two always. Therefore, this thing has to vanish. Okay. So those three terms and their corresponding uh, index reversed versions are going to disappear, which means all I've got to worry about is what's left. And so at the end, I can say that the commutator of two covariant derivatives acting on a vector v lambda is given by, uh, and actually I don't know why I wrote this this way. Let me actually see if I can see one more thing. That's confusing me. Is it the fourth term you can cancel out because the connection is symmetric? It's the fourth and the fifth, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they actually all, yeah, you're right, they all cancel. Okay, yeah, so what I could have done actually is at this level, I could have said that. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of this is done before applying torsion, but I should remember that we're applying torsion. So if we apply the torsion condition, then the Christoffel connection is symmetric in mu and nu. So at this level, when I, was, when I said I was going to subtract this off, I could have gone ahead and crossed out this term and all terms coming from it, which means that I would have gotten rid of this guy and this guy, and then this guy and this guy would be canceling from the interchange as per our discussion. So why does that one with the Christoffel connection cancel and not the other term? Hold on a second. Because weren't you saying it was because like the bottom two indices on that are interchangeable? Yeah, so th these cancel. Sorry. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, so these cancel and these cancel. Yeah, these, these obviously cancel because the mu and the nu uh, are symmetric. So sorry, go ahead. Ask me your medicine. So, you were saying when you canceled that one out on the top, it was because the bottom two indices are interchangeable? Yes, these two so indices are interchangeable. Why isn't that true then for the third one? Why can't you also cancel For this one? Yeah. Oh, because um, the only indices I'm changing are these two, mu and oh, mu. Okay. And this is mu and alpha. Okay. okay. So I actually, yes, okay, so at the end of the day, I could have saved myself a lot of writing by drawing my big purple X here. And then I would have never even written down this term or this term, and then when I expanded this one into three things and expanded this one into two things, then I can go through and make the argument that this term disappears and this term and this term would cancel. Okay. At the end of the day, all of those things marked out with purple will disappear when I subtract off the index swapped uh, versions, and I'll be left with this. Okay. Now, interesting observation. How is that related to G, the metric? 
not like technically with all the index combinations and everything, but just in sort of broad strokes. How is gamma related to the metric? Like if I said, here's a metric, build gamma, what do you do to the metric? Should I pick a victim? Adrian. So well, say the question again. How do you get the gammas from the metric? What does it involve? It involves taking the first derivative of the metric, a bunch of like three of them, and then adding them and subtracting them. Okay? But the important thing is, is that gamma involves a derivative of the metric. Therefore, the derivative of gamma involves what? Second derivative. Now the second derivative of the metric is something which I've mentioned earlier. When did I mention the second derivative of the metric? I mentioned when I talked about local inertial coordinates that we can take any space, even if it's curved, and in a small neighborhood, we can make the metric look like, to leading order, the flat metric. And furthermore, we can make the first derivative of the metric vanish. But what we cannot do is get the second derivative of the metric to vanish if the space is curved. So way back, way back young, we were seeing evidence that to figure out whether a space was curved or not, we were going to have to look at second derivatives of the metric. And here you go. So this quantity that we've computed, which I've said is going to give a good measure of curvature, contain second derivatives of the metric, sort of fulfilling that promise. Okay. And even if you compute this thing in local inertial coordinates, where this is true, it's not going to be zero, because the second derivative of the metric is not zero. Okay. So to give this thing a name, and why not? To give it a name, the quantity here okay, is defined to be R lambda rho mu nu. And that is what we call the Riemann curvature tensor. This is the fundamental object that we're going to use to say whether or not a space is curved. It, it contains the most information. All right? Now, it is a function of position. And how do we know it's a function of position? Well, remember, in general, the metric is made up of functions of position. Okay? You know, you're going to have metrics that depend on the r, theta, phi, whatever, if you got spherical polar coordinates. So if this is functions of position, derivatives are functions of position, second derivatives are functions of position. So this quantity can generally vary from point to point in the space. You can have places where you have negative curvature, positive curvature, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Something really cool about this object, it is a tensor. It's a true tensor. How do I know it's a tensor? Say it again. Because, well, how do I know it's, without even checking, how do I know it transforms like a tensor? After all, it's built out of Christoffel symbols, which are not tensors. You built it to transform like a tensor because you want, uh, you built it to be equal to zero if the space is flat. Um, and so, like, any transform. Well, that's what I wanted to do, but what in my definition guarantees me that that is the case? That it is genuinely. What on the board tells you this thing is a tensor? A commutation. Commutation of what? Uh, the two covariant derivatives. And what, what do covariant derivatives of vectors give us? Tensors. tensors. That's why we built the covariant derivative. We built the covariant derivative so that the derivative of this is a tensor, and then the derivative of this is also a tensor. So the fact that we're building this thing out of covariant derivatives tells us it is a tensor. Okay. 
That's the same argument that I used when I said that the difference of two Christoffel symbols is a tensor. So you can go back to where I introduced the Christoffel symbols. I said the same thing. So this thing is a legitimate tensor. What is the benefit of that? Let's pick the victims. Gabriel. Mm. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> Oh man! So weird, I had this weird sense that like that was a big wad of dip or something, and I was like, okay, um, oh, God. you know, what, what is the advantage? <laughs> huh? That would just be gross. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, oh God! Zero is one word. It's just really zero in all of them. Yes, exactly. The advantage that this is a tensor is that if this thing vanishes in one coordinate system, it automatically vanishes in any coordinate system. Hey, can you guys tell me how this thing transforms? Like exactly what its transformation looks like? Yes. Hell yeah. Well, uh, yes, but <laughs> but yeah, it's a tensor and it's got one upper and three lower indices. So if I ask you what does it look like in a new coordinate system, you just do the dx, 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 and then throw your indices everywhere you need to. Bless you. You allergic to Leo? Uh, no, just to Okay, all right. Well, as long as you're just um, All right, so we've got, a, we've got the Riemann curvature tensor on the board. What wonderful things can we do with that? Well, let's say a few words about this curvature tensor itself. <coughs> and I'm probably going to wish that my definition wasn't hanging out at that location of the board, but whatever. Um, all right. So, um, in four dimensions, this has how many components? This has. 256 components. Oh yeah, I guess it's also just 60. So if you're going to insist on doing calculations by hand, buy some extra pencils. Okay? The Riemann curvature tensor has 256 components. The good news is that the 256 components of the Riemann curvature tensor are not independent of each other. There is a ton of symmetry that they satisfy. So. I'm actually going to need to write this definition out of the way. So let me just copy this down. A lot of this index symmetry follows from index symmetries associated with the Christoffel symbols. Um, we won't try and weed through all of the details. Um, I will say it's important when you're writing this down to pick a definition and then make sure you get all the indices in the right place because we're going to do various things moving these indices around but you just need to remember that the upper index here is the upper index on these gammas. Um, yeah, anyway, just, just be real careful. Don't, don't just arbitrarily throw indices all over the place. The order of the indices in this expression matters. Okay, so let's actually see what we can whittle this down to through symmetries. So first of all, if I take this thing, it helps to form a version of this with all lower indices. So we can form a version that looks like this, our alpha rho mu nu. How would we form that? Horace, how would I construct this from this? You'd shift the lambda down. Using what? A dual vector transformation? Or a vector transformation? The metric. The metric. Uh -huh. the metric lowers indices, the inverse metric raises indices. So this is literally just G alpha lambda of R lambda rho mu nu. Okay. The reason I'm going to think about this object is now it kind of makes sense to talk about switching these indices. If I try and think about this, switching indices might also involve moving indices up and down. So I'm just going to talk about everything with the lower indices. So what we find is the following. These are very useful properties. R alpha rho mu nu is equal to minus R alpha rho nu mu. Okay. 
That is, if I take the last two indices of this thing and I swap them, I get a minus sign. So it's anti-symmetric in changing the last two indices. Okay. This actually follows from the fact that if I take the commutator of delta mu, delta nu, that's equal to minus the commutator of delta nu, delta mu. That, that one's actually pretty easy to see. And then we have that R alpha rho mu nu is equal to minus R rho alpha mu nu. Okay, this one's harder to track down its origin, but it's essentially anti-symmetry in the first two indices. Okay, clearly if I swap the first two indices with each other and swap the last two indices with each other, it's symmetric because you get two minus signs, but that's not new information, okay? Uh, then we have the following, R alpha rho mu nu is equal to R mu nu alpha rho. What this means is if I take the first two indices and I totally swap them with the last two indices, so take this as a chunk and just move it to the end, it's symmetric. Notice you can't get here from combining these. It's a different thing. And then lastly, we have the following condition, R alpha rho mu nu plus R alpha nu rho mu plus R alpha mu nu rho equals zero. Okay. This is essentially, just to point out, uh, this is a cyclic reordering of the last three indices. So you're just kind of moving down the train, taking the last one and moving it to the beginning, adding all three of the results together and it's zero. Okay, all together. Now, in case it's not obvious, let me, let me explain to you what I mean by this, okay? so. If, if I say that the metric is a, is a four by four matrix, then you know you write a four by four matrix. Okay, how many, how many elements does this have? 16. 16, okay. If I tell you the metric is symmetric, which it is, then what that does is it says, well, whatever this element is, it's gotta have the same value as that one. And this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And this one, and this one. So how many, Distinct components are there for a symmetric metric in four dimensions? It's 10. Okay. Four down the diagonal and six off, six off diagonals. So generally speaking, when you have symmetry or anti-symmetry conditions, they both reduce the number of independent degrees of freedom in the quantity you're considering. Okay. Well, this is a lot of index symmetry. And it turns out that we end up with only 20 distinct independent components to the Riemann curvature tensor. Now I wanna, I wanna stress, the Riemann curvature tensor has 256 components. The same way that the metric always has 16 components. <coughs> What I'm saying is that you really only have to calculate 20 of them or 10 of these because once you've got the, those, you can fill in what the rest of them are just by these symmetries. Okay? Now, when you, when you tell Mathematica to calculate the Riemann curvature tensor, it's not going to realize that it should just do 20. It's going to give you all 256. So get ready for that. The good news, I will tell you, the good news is, and I'm going to come to this right now, the good news is, is that we don't actually often work directly with the Riemann curvature tensor. Okay? And so that's the subject to which we're going to turn now. Um, so there are some very useful things that we can build from the Riemann curvature tensor, and it turns out that if we build um, these objects, then we can actually capture all of the information in the Riemann curvature tensor by thinking about simpler objects. 
But before I build these things, um, here's a quick lesson that uh, will be useful in what I'm about to say, but is also useful in general. And that is, if I take a symmetric tensor, that is, this is a, a tensor which is symmetric if I swap mu and nu, and I fully contract it with an anti-symmetric tensor, what do I get? I do get a scalar. What scalar? If you want to ring or ask Gage, he knows the answer. Katie said zero, okay, there it is, it's zero. So let's, let me just show you concretely. Let's just take mu and nu to have two components, zero and one, okay? So this thing would be something like one half T, uh, oh, no, 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 I know, I know, I know. No, I don't need to do that, just do this, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write down all of these contractions, so I'm gonna have T, zero, zero, W, 0, 0, plus T, 0, 1, W, 0, 1, plus T, 1, 0, W, 1, 0, plus T, 1, 1, W, 1, 1. That's literally what it looks like when I sum over all of the indices. I'm just taking them to have two values, okay? If this is anti-symmetric, what is this? Okay, let's go back. <coughs> if I have a matrix, and the matrix is anti-symmetric, okay, what does an anti-symmetric matrix look like? It, it says that these are equal and opposite, and these are zero. Because the whole idea is, if I switch the two indices, I have to get a minus sign. But if the two indices are the same and I switch them, I'm not doing anything. So I'm, I'm getting a minus sign for free, which can only be zero. <coughs> so these are zero. But how is this related to this? There's a minus sign. How is this related to this? It's a plus sign. So those two are going to cancel. This actually holds no matter how many values the indices take. So the, the answer is if I have two indices, if I have an object which is symmetric in two indices, and I have another object which is anti-symmetric in two indices, and I contract the symmetric indices with the anti-symmetric indices, the answer is always zero. Very, very important result. Write it in your notes. Put a big like, smiley face around it or I don't know. Whatever you do to make sure you remember stuff. Okay. That being said, let us consider the following. So... The first thing that I can do is I can take the Riemann curvature tensor and I can say, what if I make the first index the same as the upper index? Okay. I can do this by taking G lambda alpha, that's the inverse metric, and actually acting on this guy. Okay. Literally, you don't need to do anything but look at the indices to make sure, or to, to see that this gives me this. The alpha gets summed over, and it's raised to a lambda, but the lambda there is the same as the lambda there. Okay, now, important observation. How does G lambda alpha change when I interchange lambda and alpha? How does R change when I interchange lambda and alpha. It gets a minus sign. So what is this? It's zero. Okay. So if I make the upper index the same as the first index, then the Riemann tensor with that contraction vanishes. Contraction is literally just taking two indices and setting them equal so they get summed over. So that one is not going to give us anything useful. Now let's say we take the second one and make it equal to the upper one. 
So in order to do that, um, we yeah, that's fine. Alpha rho lambda nu. Okay. This is symmetric under the exchange of lambda and alpha, but the R with all the lower indices doesn't do anything particularly special when I interchange those two. I can interchange these two and get a negative, these two and get a negative, I can grab these two and swap them with these two, but just taking the alpha and the lambda and swapping them doesn't do anything particularly special. So there's no reason for this to vanish. So this guy is going to be the definition of a thing we're going to call rho r lower rho nu. This is called the Ritchie tensor. Okay. And then last but not least, if you contract over the last index, then, and you can argue this to yourself, you actually end up just getting minus r rho mu. So you get minus the Ritchie tensor. So you don't get a new and different thing contracting over the last index instead. So if I'm just going to take one index from the Riemann tensor and sum it with another one, if I'm just going to do one contraction, these are my three possibilities. One of them is zero, and the other two give me the same thing. They give me this two index object called the Ritchie tensor. You are going to be dealing with the Ritchie tensor more than you're ever going to deal with the Riemann curvature tensor. Okay. But we can go further, because if we have the Ritchie tensor, we could ask, well, what if I take the two indices of the Ritchie tensor, raise one of them, and then make them the same? Okay. So if we do that, then we can form what's called the Ritchie scalar. where we get the Ricci scalar from the Ricci tensor by using the inverse metric to raise one of the indices and then set them equal to each other. Um, one observation about the Ricci tensor, which might not be completely obvious, but it follows from this property here where you can take the first two and swap them with the last two. But what we discover is that from that property, the Ricci tensor inherits symmetry in the exchange of its lower two indices. Okay. Don't, don't conflate the relationship between this and this with this. This is saying I take the, the, a single Ricci tensor, I swap the two indices, I get the same thing. This is saying if I construct a tensor by using a different contraction of the Riemann curvature tensor, the quantity that I build is minus the Ricci tensor. Okay. So uh, just this is not an index swapping. Okay. This, however, is an index swapping. So the Ricci tensor is symmetric. Write that down, put a block around it. It's one of those very important things because you're going to work with this tensor a lot and you need to remember um, that, that symmetry. And then lastly, we can ask ourselves, all right, well, what if I took the Riemann curvature tensor? So this has got all the information I could possibly care about with curvature. And I simply subtract uh, all the information contained in all of these contractions. That's, I subtract out what information is in the Ricci tensor. I subtract out what information is in the Ricci scalar. If I do that, then I'm left with this thing called C rho sigma mu nu, which is called the vial tensor, which is a tensor that we will never use. And this is the Ricci scalar. But the idea is that I could give you V 
the vial tensor, I can give you the Ricci tensor and I can give you the Ricci scalar. And those three pieces of information would contain all the information that you could get out of the original Riemann curvature tensor. Okay, so you can either work with this object or you can work with these three objects. So now we're in a position to talk about degrees of flatness. And those who attended Physics X last Monday are going to remember elements of that discussion. How flat is flat? Okay? Different levels of flatness. First of all, we can say that the entire Riemann curvature tensor vanishes. That is, the whole enchilada is zero everywhere. For lack of a better name, I call this, Madison? Flat, flat? Flat, flat. Good. This is flat, flat. It seems totally unmotivated until I give you the, the subsequent examples. Um, examples of a flat, flat space are Minkowski space in an arbitrary number of dimensions. Euclidean space. By the way, everything that I'm giving you can be applied to spaces as well as space times. So the Riemann curvature tensor is a very important object in differential geometry where you're studying the curvature properties of spaces. Um, surprisingly, tori. So n-dimensional torus or n-dimensional tori are also flat. <laughs> And that might not be obvious, but you're going to get some experience in the homework exploring that. We can take a weaker statement that instead of the Riemann curvature tensor vanishing, only the Ricci tensor vanishes. Now, notice something which is obvious and then something which is not obvious. If this is zero, this is automatically zero because you build this thing from this. Okay. But if this is zero, that does not necessarily imply that this is zero. I can have spaces where this is zero, but this is not zero. This is what is called Ricci flat. And as a token example of a Ricci flat space, we have ADS5 cross S5. That was what I was going to guess. I know, I know. That's what everybody, does. I'm like, you know, I went to a kindergarten class to talk to them about curvature and invariance, and I was like, what do you guys think a good example of a rigid flat space is? And this kid was like, ADS5, ADS5. Is that what like? I'm just kidding. No, so this is, so first of all, this is a space which, it's 10 dimensional, 5 plus 5 is 10, it's 10 dimensional, it's a space that gets, it crops up in string theory. Actually, the first paper I ever wrote was on this space. But, um, I'm giving it to you as an example because I can kind of explain why it's ridgy flat but not flat flat. So this is a five-dimensional sphere. So you know, literally, you know, a circle is a one-dimensional sphere, and then this is a two-dimensional sphere, and then you just keep doing that. I can't do it way on this. Okay. This is a five-dimensional sphere, and I'm going to say that the radius of that sphere is R, because every sphere has a radius. That's just doesn't matter what number of dimensions you're in. The, the radius of the sphere completely defines the sphere. It's the radius and the number of dimensions, okay? So this sphere has some characteristic radius R. Spheres are examples of spaces with positive curvature, okay? Um, so for example, if you, if you constructed the Riemann curvature tensor for a sphere, you would find its values are positive everywhere, okay? anti de Sitter space is an example of a negatively curved space. And don't worry about it, we'll talk about, you know, anti de Sitter in particular, but you can, the, the spatial uh, analog of this is hyperbolic geometries. But generally the idea is that they are like spheres, but with negative radii. So the idea here is that this thing somehow has a curvature or a, a radius which is negative. And so the idea is 
if I calculated the Riemann curvature tensor, it would be smart enough to say, oh, this thing is curved and this thing is curved. But the Ricci tensor is a little dumb because it just takes the whole thing together at once where the R and the minus R cancel. So that's why you can have this thing be Ricci flat even though it's not flat flat. Now Ricci flat spaces are going to play an incredibly important role in general relativity. More so than these because these are trivial. Nothing interesting is happening on these. These spaces, you can have interesting things happen because this is not zero, but they're going to play a useful role because this is zero. Go ahead. Um, so does that also hold for like a two-dimensional sphere and a two-dimensional negative sphere? Or is it something special about five dimensions? No, it's not special to five dimensions. Um, I think you have to have at least, I think it has to be at least two and two. It would not work with one and one because a one-dimensional sphere, a circle, is not curved. And ADS1 is not really well defined. Um, but I think it would work with as few as two and two. And you could do three and three and four and four and five and five and six. I mean, you can go up to anything you want. Okay. All right. And then the last, the last couple of categories are C rho sigma mu nu. That is the vial tensor is zero. This condition is what is called conformal, conformally flat. Um, and what this means is that we can take the space and we can map it to flat space, one of these examples, using a set of conformal transformations. And if you don't know what conformal transformations that's okay, are, that's okay. You'll see them if you take complex analysis, but they're generally coordinate transformations which preserve the angles between vectors. Okay, so a conformally flat space can actually look curved, but you can do a conformal mapping to flat space. We're not going to deal with too many, uh, we're not, I don't think we're going to deal with any. And then last but not least is this condition, which is so useless it doesn't even have a name. It's just called R equals zero, and that's when the Ricci scalar vanishes. Um, but that's not particularly uh, powerful of a condition to impose on things. Um, okay, so I actually, I think I'm just going to go ahead and end there, and that will be the content of that. And then when we meet on Tuesday, we are actually going to talk about general relativity. It's on time. Yeah, sorry about that. I was really going to press on for like two more pages of notes, but... Why don't you just make this class like a bit? I know, I know, I know. Trust me, I'm going to read your reviews at the end and you're all going to be like, I've never finished this class on time.